Our voices. Our stories. Our community. I've walked them all with my cane and seen little children going, Mommy, what that? And Mommy ushering the children out of the way and saying, she can't see, in a whisper. We got other people talking about how to talk language or communicate with deaf people. It's pretty hard. I had searched for services in Manitoba, but there's nothing was going to happen to me. Well, if we didn't have a deafblind community, all the deafblind would be stuck at home. Winnipeg, Manitoba is the jewel of the prairies. Located in the geographic middle of Canada, with a population approaching a million citizens, this prairie town boasts more sunny days than any other city in Canada. Winnipeg is defined by the confluence of the Assiniboine and Red Rivers, which meet at the forks in the heart of the city. The River City is also home to some of the most generous Manitobans with social services and organizations, like the Resource Center for Manitobans who are blind-deaf, supporting a growing population of deaf-blind who are living independently. My name is Angela Main obergon and I'm the coordinator at the Resource Center for Manitobans who are deaf-blind. Our CMDB has been around for 20 years now in Winnipeg, and i um, fortunate to have our CMDB in Winnipeg because Many provinces don't have any supports or services for deafblind folks. Many deafblind folks um, live in complete isolation. You know, they don't have workers to go out shopping with them. Some of them actually live in um, personal care homes. You know, some have families, but they don't know how to communicate with them. You know, so having um, RCMDB here in Winnipeg, um, it livens up this community. Previously, I was the chairperson, the first chairperson of the Manitoba Deaf Blind Association. And the Manitoba Deaf Blind Association was set up to advocate for services because there was no services for people such as myself in Manitoba. So it became a passion of mine that ICMDB was a success because it was part of something I had dreamed of and advocated for it. Even with services, Steve, life can be very, very isolating. Um, I live at home alone, and so, yes, I can send emails all day, but that's not quite the same. We sat down with Executive Director Bonnie Heath to discuss some of the challenges. The deafblind community themselves, their number one complaint, concern, challenge, barrier, whatever you want to call it, is the isolation. Everybody has said that blind people are 20 years behind other, deaf, other disabled organizations because part of what happened with the, when the services were set up was the fact that deaf blind people never had a stay before. And that's because we never had services before, so we were always so isolated. We were never out in public. And I used to belong to the Deaf and Blind Society, but I stopped seeing them for several years. Didn't feel there was enough stimulation going on there. There was something missing. And I didn't realize there was something missing in me. I wasn't ready to interact. I wasn't ready to be able to allow people to help me and assist me and show me that I can still do a lot of stuff that I thought I couldn't do. We just have the most amazing service support providers as well as interveners that work with our deafblind people on a day-to-day -day basis. Because as an intervener, you're now not only uh, facilitating communication, but you're also guiding. So you're the ears and the eyes of the deafblind person. It's a lot of work and it involves a lot of teamwork as well. So we're never doing anything for the deafblind person, we're doing it with the deafblind person. Manitoba interveners are probably at the, among the best in all Canada. I've traveled from Halifax all the way to Vancouver and everywhere I've gone they've been in awe at what wonderful interveners Manitoba has. Interveners have a very important job. Their main obstacle when working with a member of the deafblind community 
is communication. One of the ways interveners communicate is hand over hand, a form of tactile sign language that allows communication without sight or hearing. Jane, Sarah, and I are invited usually once a year to augment the curriculum that the ASL English Interpreter Training Program provides. We only get to do two workshops at Red River College to explain how an intervener is a different job than an interpreter. It's still facilitating communication, it's still facilitating interactions, but it's altogether different. It, it's really important that they experience uh, being deaf blind, so we give them earplugs and blindfolds, and then we walk around the college in pairs. They discover how vulnerable a deafblind person feels being guided by another individual. With Bonnie, it's so, so important because those are future interveners sitting there. There needs to be much, much more training than there is, but at least it's a start. Our community will return after the break. We now return to our community. This community is so diverse. There's so many uh, deafblind folks with um, different communication needs, different guiding techniques. Um, and so, you know, didn't matter. It doesn't matter if you work with them for one year or five years, you're always learning something new. All the staff here are very, very nice. I don't know how, what I do without them. Gail is super sweet and I just, I really love her. <laughs> I have the, um, the SSP come teach me, a good friend of mine come every Monday. If I didn't understand what she said, she took the opportunity, grab my hand, and <laughs> she want me to learn this because I know my vision gonna get worse. I can't escape from that. I think it's an emotional issue that you have to deal with on a regular basis. Especially if you've had your sight and you had your hearing. Let's face it, you know you're missing it. You know, and you have to deal with that on a regular basis. You have to deal with getting up in the morning and going, yep, it was quiet last night. You know, and you put your hearing aid on and Oh, you know, somebody got the radio on and you're going, yep, I got to miss all that. You know, and, and part of it can be rejoiceful. Part of it can be like, my baby was crying last night and I didn't hear it. And that's hard. Started with the center, if it hadn't been for them, I'd be living in an apartment, period, by myself, and where to ever go out. Staying at home is not the answer. I'm getting out more often, go shopping more often, and I always write down what I want. And I'll have a copy from the last one, and I'll give it to the SSP. They'll look at it, oh, and then they know, and then, so, aha. So that's the way I help them to find my food. The Deafblind Center provides essential and social services, as well as facilitating sports and cultural activities. Sports is a big part of deaf culture, and Neil was hard of hearing growing up. When he did have more hearing and more vision, he used to watch the games. When I was a young boy, and I play, I'm street hockey with my friend all the time, every night we play. I don't follow any sort of hockey. My favorite team is the Montreal Canadiens. I always love to watch it every Saturday night, watch the hockey. And then I really love hockey. So it's fun to play and fun to watch. And for the park going, my friend was on the board. And then I know with the park going or the players so I can follow the hockey more easily. 
Neil still loves going to hockey games with a guiding hand from his intervener on a custom board representing the ice rink, not being able to hear or see is not an issue. When I go to the hockey game, I like to listen to the crowd reaction and feel like I'm part of the crowd, feel like part of the game, but I can't deep for my member right and the so I like to the fear the fit. Neil may not be able to hear or see the crowd, but he can still feel the excitement. The Deaf and Blind Society has helped me greatly just by helping me learn about my ability to do things that I thought I couldn't do anymore. And they are teaching me that, you know what? Yeah, you're deaf and you're blind, but why should that stop you? Why should that stop me from doing my thing? She took me to the studio that she goes to and was showing me all the different glass they have and all the different tools they have there to work with, and it was just amazing. But I, I want to take stained glass class now. <laughs> When my kids heard about me taking a thing glass class, they were like, oh my God, mom going to cut her fingers. And I proved to them by the pieces that I'd done, they're going, so great mom. You know, and they're like, they're looking at the glass, still with a little cautious eye, but <laughs> it's just another one of those things that says that, you know what, I can do it. I like it. These deaf blind individuals are so independent and because remember they used to drive a car they went to high school they have families and children and like all of us but at some point unfortunately the combination of the vision and hearing loss just becomes too much when you're working with people who are deaf and blind and you see the courage not just the courage but the sense of humor and the autonomy like a lot of our clients live in their own homes by themselves do their own laundry, do their own cooking, when they're going out of the house is where we then provide the support. Our community will return after the break. We now return to our community. The thing is to get out of the house and do things while I still have some vision left. So we try and do crafts twice a month. I would go and pick up whatever client I'm scheduled to work with that day, and we would come to uh, the Deaf Centre in Manitoba, and we go up to the room, and the craft gets explained to them. Isla's pretty independent, um, so just set her up, and she goes, and we get to chit-chat, and it's really fun. It's not really work at all. And my, my son has decided that when he grows up, he wants my job because we get to do such awesome things. I love craft and I love people that enjoy craft. Together, it's magic. Because people that are creative in all areas of their lives, <laughs> I think are more interesting in a sense that they they got so much to share, so much to talk about. And so when I interact with Gail, it was like, yeah, you know what it's like. You know what it, this, how fun it is just to play. What I like about the craft and art, it keeps your hand busy. And you can do what you like to do, what you like to make. What it brings is a creative expression. It also provides another opportunity as to escape from their day-to-day -day lives. You know, and that's what craft does to me. It's like it's, it's playtime all over again. Like being a kid, it's playtime. I get to get messy, you know? <laughs> and having that relationship with her and knowing that I could look over if there was something I couldn't see in front of me that was part of my craft project, she would always you know, here it is, and she'd be able to give it to me. So, it's like a sisterhood. 
feeling that we both can share. Like, you know, it's like she comes up to me and says, okay, so what are we going to do today? And that, it's nice. There's a, there's a huge bond and there's a lot of emotions involved. Um, it's not a nine to five job. It's not a job where you go and then after that you forget about everybody. You know, you're always thinking about everybody after work, before work, during work. You know, you, you build relationships with every individual. With interpreting, you could be going to doctor's appointment and not really know who you're gonna meet up with. Whereas I know these clients more on a personal level and I think that draws, draws me to it. Hugs were part of the fun culture. A tight hug is worth a thousand words, right? I honestly don't know where I would be if I didn't have that type of support in my life. It's an affectionate group, you know? So it's, you know, you have to be affectionate too. And it's, it's not hard to be affectionate when others are showing you affection. So it's really nice. It's kind of interesting. We've been able to kind of develop a relationship over the past couple of years. Gail's awesome, Bonnie's awesome, the whole crew, they're just amazing, and I love them. My name's Mandel Hitzer, I'm the chef and owner at Deer and Almond Restaurant, uh, and we're in the middle of the Exchange District in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, so I chose to kind of help out the Manitoba Resource Center for the Deaf Blind, and they're so grateful for like any little thing that we do, and it, it's, it's just like, Almost, you know, not only, it makes my heart melt. Bonnie just says, would you, can you do a favor for me? I said, sure. Would you make a little speech for Mandel? I thought, oh, they were right, and I said, yes. But I had fun. Um, once I got next to him, on behalf of the deafblind people, we wish to thank you for, for all you have done for it. Then, of course, I hugged him, and they told me that he was smiling. I couldn't see that part. Like any other community, things could always be better. One of the biggest challenges facing the deafblind community is finding housing that meets their needs. The interpreting agency office came to the Forks many years ago, and I love it because it's a meeting place. And also we, we have a great partnership with the Forks and North Portage Corp. And we hope that at some point, you know, maybe we will be able to locate a housing project. And so I see the Forks as, as really significant for that reason in terms of the Aboriginal community and just it's sacred. And the work we do with deafblind people is also sacred. So it's a good fit. Last year, actually, at the Forks, we had our 20th anniversary, and we had um, about 100 or so people come and celebrate with us uh, to raise funds and awareness for deafblind folks. And the purpose of the dinner was to um, not only to promote a little bit of RCMDB, but to fundraise for you know our deafblind housing, which will be in our future. The deafblind housing project at this point is probably one of the most important career goals I have. I don't feel like I can retire until that housing is established and built and people are moved in. The deafblind housing to me would be accessible housing. And this has been identified by the deafblind community as something where they would like to live with, in and amongst the rest of the community. Um, and have the resource center located on site. Do my next door neighbors need to be deafblind too? No, be nice to have them in the same building maybe so I can pop down and talk, see them, not have to worry about them. We're very much a go-to organization when it comes to, to planning and preparing and building an organization in different provinces. We're going to have a national deafblind camp next year at Camp Manitou. Deafblind people are going to come from across Canada. It's like build it and they will come. And so I suspect that those people who are coming from other environments who don't have the same kind of level of support, you know, they're going to like what they see. So they'll either go home and advocate for those to happen at home, or some might even relocate here. So I'm glad Bonnie came along and all the others and got the ball game going. Just like they're doing with the deafblind housing. We've been doing it for quite a few years now.
My first day of fever is that I know I have to move. I'm not getting any younger. I have my hopes and dreams, and I, um, I think every person has their hopes and dreams for a better future. Um, and I guess that, to me, deaf line housing was a hope and dream of a better future, that's all. We want to empower them, right? That's for sure. But also, the only way we can do a proper job is by listening to them tell us what they need. I think that most of us who experience blindness and deafness want to be understood. We want someone to ask us, what's it like? What does it feel like? You know, what do you see? The province of Manitoba has proven to be a leader in providing its deaf-blind community with the supports they need to live a full and independent life. With many challenges ahead, the deaf-blind community are shaping their own future. Producer, Totem Studios. Writer-director, Stephen J. Payne. Director of Photography, Editor, Scott McKay. Editor, Andrew Antonello. Music, Sean Fletcher. Camera, Dylan Henderson. Kirk Furland. Sherry LaRock, Ben Nataway, Sarah Maynard, Integrated Described Video Specialist Ron Rickford, President and CEO David Arrington, Copyright 2017, Accessible Media Incorporated.